It's another opportunity for us to come together and hear and learn of the word of truth that is given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only help, help, hope for salvation. Yes, yes. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast and give him freely as a gift to anyone who obeys him. We understand that if anyone does not obey him, it is made manifest and made obvious that they do not believe. And in this state, we should expect no good thing from the Most High God. However, anything that we do get, whether it be a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy, or any other supernatural experience, it can and it will be used against us in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that's in the room and to the saints that couldn't make it. Uh, but no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. So today we're going to do something a little different. Uh, it's not going to be the typical Bible study. We're going to go over um, a little bit of history because it's Black History Month. Um, a little bit of history that uh, is one untaught um, and uh, some of the history that connects us back to Africa, uh, us being descendants of slaves, right? So um, those of us that are descendants of slaves, not descendants of Japanese people and white people. But um, for those of us... <laughs> no, but uh, those of us that are des descendants of slaves will be able to look back into our history um, and kind of see what is written down, what was recorded, um, and how we connect to that and uh, the implications of it. A lot of times we look at, um, since we come to find out that we're Hebrews, our descendants of the Israelites, we, uh, we look at a lot of people out there that hear about it and they just take it at faith value. Like last... Last week, we talked about the Bereans who, when they heard the word, they took it with joyful, with a joyful heart, right? And then they went back and they checked behind. They said, we got to, to make sure these things are so. So they checked into the book for themselves. A lot of times, we, we have a joyful heart when we hear something. We hear something that we want to hear, right? We Hebrews, and that's a prestigious nation. So, you know, it's like, hey, well, yeah, that's what I want to be. White people respect it, right? That's what I want to be. We hear we Egyptians. It's like, okay, well, yeah, that's what I want to be. White people respected it. And so a lot of times we latch on to stuff and there's no real evidence. So what we want to do now is we want to try to make, make solid the evidence because some of us don't, you know, some of us doubt, right? We got people that watch in. I talked I talk to, um, talk to previously and they say, well, even though they believe it, they don't really talk about it too much because, you know, people, not everybody believes it. And so what happens is, what happens is we have a history that we're ashamed to speak on because we that other people will doubt, which causes us to doubt. So I don't want to bring it up into a group of people and let them know, hey, yeah, no, I'm a descendant of the Hebrew. The same way that they tell us, my great, 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 great grandfather came from Italy and he he was related to Christopher Columbus. Right? They would be very proud of that for us. We don't have that, and it's in a way been taken away from us, and we don't have that same type of history that we can go back to. And now that we are getting back to it, we're ashamed because we're afraid that if we were proud of that history in front of people, people wouldn't believe it. So what I want to do now is I want to try to set forth the evidence to where we'll feel comfortable with who we are and we'll feel proud of our inheritance just like other people do. And more importantly, that we'll be able to better understand the prophecies and the things that are to come and have hope and the blessings from the Most High God that he's uh, pronounced on our people. All right. First of all, right. He said to the Jew first. And then the Gentile. All right, so the presentation that we're going to go over is identifying the African roots of the Atlantic slaves, evidence connecting African Americans to the ancient Hebrews of Israel. Okay? The reason why we go over these things um, is mostly, mostly because, well, let's talk about the reason why we're not going over it. Well, we're, the reason why we're not going to, we're not going over this as a self-esteem. A lot of, like we talked about it a little bit before, there, there's a lot of things that go, even Black History Month as a whole, a lot of times is about self-esteem, right? We're not really taught about racism, right? We're taught, we're taught about how many, how many great things that black people did for the country. And it's more about building us up and making us feel good. But at the same time, let's talk about, um, as a friend of mine said, let's talk about what people had to go through in those times coming up with those, what adversity they had to face. How is it detrimental to our society as a whole, right? Um, and in the same way, what the goal of this is not to just pick somebody out of Africa and say, hey, let's have a self-esteem party. Let's all feel good about ourselves. The goal of this is to show the truth. All right. It just so happens that the group is 
a prestigious group, right? The Israelites, uh, that's a well-respected group in the world. Um, so we're going to try to talk about all that stuff and, and kind of figure out how it plays out. Um, but first, we're going to play a video. What you're going to see in this video is you're going to see a lot of the stuff that's been happening to our people just over the last few years. And then you're going to hear at the same time Obama talking. Okay? So we're going to try to see how that sounds and how the images go with what he's saying. So here tonight, we must confront the reality that around the world, anti-Semitism is on the rise. We cannot deny it. And when we see some Jews leaving European cities where their families have lived for generations because they no longer feel safe, when Jewish centers are targeted from Mumbai to Overland Park, Kansas, when swastikas appear on college campuses, when we see all that and more, we must not be silent. An attack on any faith is an attack on all of our faiths. It is an attack on that golden rule at the heart of so many faiths that we ought to do unto others as we would have done to us. For Americans in particular, we should understand that it's an attack on our diversity, on the very idea that people of different backgrounds can live together and thrive together. Which is why your father was right. We are all Jews. Because anti-Semitism is a distillation, an expression of an evil that runs through so much of human history. And if we do not answer that, we do not answer any other form of evil. That's why when voices around the world veer from criticism of a particular Israeli policy to an unjust denial of Israel's right to exist, when Israel faces terrorism, we stand up forcefully and proudly in defense of our ally, in defense of our friend, in defense of the Jewish state of Israel. America's commitment to Israel's security remains now and forever unshakable. And I've said this before, it would be a fundamental moral failing if America broke that bond. All nations that prize diversity and tolerance and pluralism must speak out whenever and wherever Jews and other religious minorities are attacked. May the memory of the lost be a blessing. And as nations and individuals, we, may we always strive to be among the righteous. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. And God bless the state of Israel. state of Israel, but only a little bit, what we're mostly going to talk about is the people of Israel. So immediately what comes to people's mind is if we talk about the people of Israel being black, it's, it's never been presented that way. So I want to kind of take us through some of the other things that's been whitewashed. This is actually Hebrews that, that are from um, ancient Rome. Um, this is from the 11th century, so that would be 11th century, it would be like 10 or 1000 BC, all the way, I mean, I'm sorry, 1000 um, AD, all the way to 1100 uh, AD. So this is pictures, and clearly you can see they're black. These are not black people who wrote this, these are Greeks who wrote this, and they put the pictures in there, all right? So these are ancient documents. What this actually is called a Bristol Psalter. A Psalter is a psalm, pretty much. So it's, you know, like today they hand out the New Testament only Bibles with psalms and proverbs. So they had a version of that, but it's only psalms. Um, and it was an ancient form, and then they would paint pictures inside of the book. All idolatry, but that's a whole other story. But they would paint pictures inside of the book of, you know, Yahushua and all these, you know, all these other figures. Um, this one, I believe, was um, Joshua. I'm not Joshua, uh, Joseph. Um, and then this one was King David. All right. 
So they put these pictures, and clearly you can see that they're black, right? Um, but now we get to a time, and it's like, we've never seen this. We've never been portrayed to us this way, but it has been portrayed that way in the past. All right, so we just kind of want to look at the whitewashing. Um, again, these are other documents. These are not, this is not anybody from the Bible, but these are Christian pictures. Um, uh, this is a, a pope, I believe, and uh, these are other people. And again, you can see that they have dark skin, right? Um, and then this is something more close to our time. So this is Frederick du Douglass. This is the real picture of him. But then this is the picture that's in D.C. today, Washington, D.C. right now. If you go to Washington, D.C. and go to their uh, the National Portrait Gallery, they have this picture there. Right. Yeah. Today. Right now. Right. So you see that it's not it's not anything. It's never stopped the whitewashing. Whenever they get a chance, they can you know, they'll present someone more favorably as they I mean, even characters. It's easier now because of so many pictures. Characters are now whitewashed, so that's why you won't hear certain things from Martin Luther King um, when these type of things come around. But then you might have some black pro-black page put up something, a speech from him that seems that's not the Martin Luther King I heard about because they watch they just whitewash his character, right, to make him more acceptable. That's why you'll never they'll say, tell you how great Martin Luther King was. They'll never say anything about Malcolm X, right, because they kind of want to whitewash his what he stood for out of history, out of black history. So why is all this important at all, right? Because immediately when you think of it, people um, are going to tell you that everybody gets into the kingdom if they uh, if Jesus died for them, right? So as long as Jesus died on the cross for your sins, everybody gets into the kingdom. And that's true, right? Because we have, we have Revelation 7, 9 that tells us, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of, all nations, all kindreds, and people, and tongues, uh, stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. All right. So it says all kindreds, all people. Right. So we know that it's not something by race that you are saved or make it into the kingdom. So why is it important for us to connect back to our history? Well, the reasons are fourfold. One is prophecy. All right. There are certain prophecy that's specific to descendants, physical descendants of Israel. Um, another one is our history, right? Every other nation almost can go onto Ancestry.com and they can be proud of where they come from and they can talk about where they come from and they can use that history to establish who they are today. Um, but we don't have that, so I believe we should have that right as well and I don't think it should offend anybody for us to have that right. Um, then also racism, right? Um, to justify slavery, uh, one of the things that they said is that we were descendants of Ham. Um, so they used the Bible and uh, descendants of people in the Bible to justify their, our slavery. So I think it would only be fair for us to use the Bible and uh, things outside of the Bible to justify that we are not the descendants of Ham. In fact, we're also the descend We're actually the, the descendants of Israel. Um, and then lastly, it matters because they think it matters. All right. So here goes another video. So why do you think these right wingers suddenly love the Jews so much? Well, I mean, and you would is, know. Is and I did. See I do know, religion. but I want to know why you. I did see it, and that a lot of Christian conservatives are huge supporters of Israel. Huge. I huge agree. Supporters. This is not why? new. Uh, because they believe that's where the end of days will happen, and they want to protect Israel. Right. They want to protect Israel Thank from destruction. You. We know this. No, but so what happens? What, 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 what happens to the Jews at the end of days? Well, Christians <laughs> have a certain uh, storyline there. What that, happens uh, <laughs> to the Jews? <laughs> uh, Barack Obama has said repeatedly, time after time, that there is nothing more important than the United States' friendship with Israel, and that the United States will back up Israel every moment of every day if and when he becomes president of the United States. In a 2013 Pew Research survey, in answer to the question, was Israel given to the Jewish people by God, 40% of Jewish Americans said yes. 44% of all Americans said yes and 51% of black Protestants said yes. Yeah, so don't let anybody tell you that, no, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter who the Jews were all saved now, because you'll see when it's not about us, it does matter to them, right? Polls across the nation, a president can't get elected in this country unless he, unless he emphasizes his support for Israel, 
right? Every president has to, right? So it, 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 it does matter to him. It absolutely matters to him. It just doesn't matter when it's us. Same way lives are. It matters when people die. All lives matter until one of us die, all right? And uh, it matters, you know, Barack Obama was the president for all people. It just so happened that he didn't do too much for us, right? So it, it, it always comes up to everybody is equal, everybody is on the same page until it's something that is specific to us. And it's like, ah, uh, you guys are doing too much, right? So let's continue on. What can we expect and what we're going to go over? Um, we're going to use the word, we're going to use archaeology, and we're going to use historical testimony to show evidence for Hebrews in Africa, and, um, and they're, from, they're, they're in Africa from ancient times, um, the skin color of the Hebrews, and the roots of the Jewish people today. So we'll start with the roots of the Jewish people today. Um, this is from one of their websites. Judaism 101 is what they titled this page. Um, it's asking the question, what is Judaism? So they kind of give you the bullet points here at the top. Um, Judaism has been described as a religion, a race, a culture, and a nation. So you notice that they didn't call any of those. They say that it has been described as these things. Then next they say, all of these descriptions have some validity. The Jewish people are best described as an extended family. So as you can look at it, it's no real definition that they've given us. But let's read some more into what they're saying. What is Judaism? What does it mean to be a Jew? Most people, both the Jewish and Gentile, would instinctively say that Judaism is a religion. And yet there are uh, militant atheists who insist that they are Jews. Is Judaism a race? If you were to say so, most Jews would think you were anti-Semite. We're going to come back to that word anti-Semite and try to talk about what that means. But for their sake, what they're saying is that you're anti a person that's Jewish. You're against Jewish people. Um, but we'll talk about what the real word means and what, it, what the real roots are. Um, so they ask, what is Judaism? So if you look there, they, it, it's a very confusing for them to even explain what Judaism is. So we're going to go to another question. Who is a Jew? So it's telling you a person whose mother is a Jew or a person who um, has gone through the formal process of conversion to Judaism. So that's how you become a Jew, according to Jewish people today. All right. So T, grab the book for me. Let's, uh, let's open up and let's go to Numbers Chapter 1, verse 4. We actually are not going to use the book too much today, but there's a few things I want to tackle. This is Numbers chapter 1, verse 4. So they say that if your mother is a Jew, then that, that's what defines you as a Jew. So we just want to show that's, that's absolutely contrary to our law. And with you, there shall be a man of every tribe. A man of every tribe. Everyone head of the house of his fathers. Everyone head of the house of who? His fathers. So the way you identified your tribe is by your father. Right? It was never by mother. Right? If you look at all the genealogies that we see in the book, always goes through the father, never the mother. So the mother never. And in fact, we actually have a lot of mothers in the book who were not of Israel. But the children were still considered Israel. All right. So it's important for us to know that based off of our book, it's the father that determines what nation you're in. OK. Um, the next thing that they have here is they say it's important to know that being a Jew has nothing to do with what you believe or what you do. So that just tells you that it's not a religion. Right. They said being a Jew has nothing to do with what you believe or what you do. Right. A person born to non-Jewish parents who has not undergone the formal process of conversion, but who believes everything that Orthodox Jews believe and observe every law and custom of Judaism is still a non-Jew. Well, that's not our book. If we had a Gentile that came to us, grab, um, grab Numbers 15. Numbers 15, verse 13. If we had a Gentile that came to us and they wanted to obey our laws, let's see what the book says. All that are born of the country shall do these things after this manner, in offering and offering made by fire, mm -hmm. of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. And if a, stranger, if a stranger sojourn with you, or whosoever be among you in your generations, and will offer an offering made by fire, of a sweet savor unto the Lord, as ye do, he shall do. Mm -hmm. One ordinance shall be for both uh, for you of the congregation, and also for the stranger that sojourns with you, 
an ordinance forever in your generations as ye are, so shall the stranger be before the Lord. All right. So he said, as long as they keep the ordinances, that's going to be the same with you and them, then they'll be the same before me as you are. He said, I'm not going to look at them any different. Right. So that's our conversion process. You got to keep the law. It says, even if a Jew, I mean, even if a Gentile came in and they did all the stuff, they still can't do it unless one of their people come in and, and make them a Jew however they do it. Right? So this is what they believe today. And this is what we want to do is try to dig into who these people are, how they got here. Okay? So this is a man named Hasdai. As Hasdai, the son of Shapru. All right? He was living at the time of 19, I mean, 9, 915 A.D., to 975 AD. Okay? So that's a thousand years ago. Um, this is kind of like a synopsis about what we're, we're about to read. So Hasdai is best known for his letter in 960 AD that he sent to the king of the Khazars, a people of, on the banks of the Volga in Russia who had accepted Judaism, influenced by Jews who migrated from Persia and Babylonia. Um, the Khazars converted to Judaism in the 9th century. OK, so this is a little part of his letter and this part. So this is his letter right here. And this part, he opens it up and he identifies himself and look out how unique it is. He says, I and this is actual history. This is stuff that's out there. You can go look it up yourself. He said, I has I son of Isaac, son of Ezra. You notice he didn't name his moms. Right. Son of Ezra belonging to the exiled Jews of Jerusalem. All right. So he identified himself as coming from the Jews of Jerusalem. So that means he was a physical descendant. OK, then he says in Spain. So he was living in Spain at the time, a servant of my Lord, the king bowed to the earth before thee. So he went on. He gre greets this king. What he's doing is he's writing to a king because he heard this king had a Jew nation. Right. It was a nation of Israelites. And he was looking because he's a man is he understands the curse that's on this. So he's looking. He's like. It's an Israelite nation out there. He's like, that's, that's unbelievable. So he wrote to him to try to understand. He's like, bless you. You're an Israelite and you're running the nation. So he asked him, what tribe are you from? What's your family? What's your lineage? Thinking that this was the actual Israelite. So the king was honest about it. He comes back. This is, this is the king writing back to him. He says, you asked also in your epistle, the king is writing to Azai, you asked also in your epistle of what people, of what family, and of what tribe, are, I mean, we are know that we are descendants from Japheth. OK, so we're going to talk about Japheth in a little bit. We are descendants of Japheth through his son, Torgoma, Togorma, right? So grab uh, Genesis chapter 10. Is Genesis chapter 10, verse 1. Again, all the stuff we can go over, I'm only giving you guys verifiable facts. That's it. I'm only giving you, I'm only giving stuff that you can look up yourself. Not a whole bunch of speculation and all that. I'm giving you stuff that you can look up for yourself. True testimony, things that have been documented, things that have been attested to, things that you can find. Okay. Now, these are the generations of the son of sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And mm -hmm. unto them were sons born after the flood. Mm -hmm. the Who's sons first? Of, the sons of Japheth. So, you remember, that's who, we, that's who the, the king of K, the Khazars, that's who he said he was coming from. He said, I'm a descendant of Japheth. All right? Which is the same as Japheth here. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, mm -hmm. and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tiras. Mm -hmm. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz and Riphath. So hold on, the sons of Gomer is who? Ashkenaz and Riphath. So Ashkenaz, if we go back to this page, right, Judaism 101, they'll tell you a type of Jew is an Ashkenazic Jew. All right? We didn't make that up. That's right there in the Bible, right? And it says Ashkenaz. It says it's the son of Japheth. And then... It says that his name is Ashkenaz. They had a descendant named Ashkenaz. And they, on their own website, call themselves Ashkenazi Jews. Let's keep going. And Riphath and Tagorma. Mm -hmm. 
and the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. Mm -hmm. By these were the islands of the Gentiles divided in their lands. These were the islands of who? The Gentiles divided in their lands. So we have it by their own mouth, they're Ashkenazi Jews. And then the book tells us that that was the Isles of the Gentiles. Didn't say that they were Jews. Didn't say anything like that. It said that they were Gentiles, right? So we want to try to understand what's going on. Let's go to Genesis chapter 9. Verse 26. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. All right? He said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. This is, so let's background. This is um, Noah. He's putting blessings and curses on his sons after an event just happened. All right? So he says, Blessed be the God of Shem. Canaan's going to be his servant. And what's going to happen with Japheth? God shall enlarge Japheth. He said, God shall enlarge Japheth. And he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. And he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. So remember, we talked about anti-Semite briefly. This is where anti-Semite comes from, Shem. So Shem is really anti-Shemite. Um, it's just through English. The word is, you know, the word, some of the sounds got lost. Um, so anti-Shemite just means you're anti a descendant of Shem, right? So Hebrews, Israelites are descendants of Shem. Japheth Gentiles are descendants of everybody else, but more specifically descendants of J uh, Japheth. Okay, so you have the Gentiles and the Ashkenazis and all that that are descendants of Japheth. Uh, Israelites are descendants of Shem. When they say anti-Semite, they're trying to say you're anti-Jews. But really, they are not Jews. They're Ashkenaz by their own mouth. So that's why that word's a little mixed up. But let's try to see, according to the Bible, why that makes a little bit more sense. So it says, God shall enlarge Japheth, he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant, right? It's something very interesting about one of the words in this sentence. That word is enlarge, okay? So it says, God shall enlarge Japheth. So this word enlarge is actually a Hebrew word pronounced pathah. So the Hebrew word pathah, this is how it's translated in the King James Version. Entice, this is every time it's translated. It's this word pathal that they got enlarged out of is entice ten times, deceive eight times, persuade four times, flatter two times, allure once, enlarge once, and this is the one time here, silly one once, and silly once. So out of all those words, which one seems like it doesn't belong? Enlarge, right? Every one of them, you can you can kind of make a connection. You're silly. You're silly one. You're gullible. That means it's easy to deceive you or entice you or persuade you or flatter you or allure you, right? So all of those kind of have like the same kind of meaning, right? The same kind of they're getting at the same thing. Enlarge doesn't have anything to do with any of those. However, the only time that word is used is this one time here, all right? So if we were to say... Instead of saying enlarge, let's say entice, since that was the most times, that's how it was translated the most times. God shall entice Japheth, and she, he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. It takes on a brand new meaning at that point. When it says Japheth and Shem, God always recognized the father of the house to represent the people, right? So what it's really saying is God shall deceive the descendants of Japheth, like the Ashkenaz, right, like the Khazars, the Jewish converts, and he shall dwell in the tents of the descendants of Shem, like the Israelites. So now you see the Jewish people that are in Israel today, those are actually our tents, and they're dwelling in them just according to this prophecy. Um, this is another letter that we have. Uh, this is... Um, his name was Moses. He is Moses, the son of Maimon, and he wrote to Obadiah, who was a convert. He was a proselyte, right? The reason why this letter is important because it kind of gives us a hint on how it came about, right? So if we look, he asked, he or well, it was asked, but he's responding to what Obadiah asked him. So Obadiah was a Gentile who converted to Judaism, or converted to our religion, rather. Um, he said, you ask concerning procedure with regard to the benediction and prayers when you pray privately or with the congregation, 
may you say God of our fathers uh, who has sanctified us by his commandments and who has separated and chosen us to given and given us an inheritance to our fathers and brought us out of the land of Egypt and did miracles to our fathers and all such similar phrases he says you must say all of these so this is he, he said you ask me this question like should you say these things should you say our father who's brought us out of Egypt because he's the Gentile so technically he didn't get brought up out of Egypt so he's saying you ask me these things and this is his response you must say all of these things as they are right so just like the way they're, they, they're written that's how you have to say them he says and you must not change a single word but just as a born Israelite prays and blesses so must you pray also bless and pray whenever you are praying privately or in the canter of the co congregation. So he, he advised him. This is an actual he's an actual Israelite um, and he's advising the gentleman. He's saying, no, you have to say it. You convert it now. So he said, you have to say it exactly how it's written. So you can see with this going on, our people being persecuted, as we're going to talk about soon. And you have people brought in that saying you are an Israelite. You have to present yourself as an Israelite when you pray. You can see how it's very easy for them to take on that identity. It's very easy for them to be enticed into believing that they were actually Israelites. Right. With our people being removed and them taking that dominant role. Right. And so that's where you can kind of see it happening. This is just evidence to show that this was allowed by our people. Our people actually gave them that. We told them we advised them to act that way and to be that way. So if we were to fast forward to 1948, that's when the nation of Israel or the state of Israel that Obama just talked about. That's when that was created. All right. So this is the creation of Israel. 1948 on May 14, 1948, David Ben Gurion, I guess the head of the Jewish agency proclaimed the establishment of the state of Israel. U.S. President Harry S. Truman recognized a new nation on the exact same day. And from there, we've always been supporters of Israel. All right. So it, it always has mattered to these people. All right. Now we want to see if it still matters when they find out it's us. Last thing here, he says they left black. This is a man named um, Gamal Abdul Nasser. All right. He was the president of Egypt. Uh, in, I don't have a year on here, actually. I think it was like 19, 19, I think it was like 1950 something. It was a little bit after the Israelites or the, um, the Jewish people went back into Israel. All right. So a little bit after that, this is what he said. Um, the Jews will never be talking about the, the white Jews, right? He said the Jews will never be able to live here in peace because they left here black but they came back white. All right. So this is the actual president. It's not somebody we just made us the actual president of over, over a nation who's done wonderful things. A lot of people love him. They still, they still hold him in high regard. As you can see, he made time magazine. So this is the actual person who was very famous. And this is what he said when he was asked, will there ever be peace in the middle East? He's like, no, they'll, they'll never live here in peace. Cause they left black and they came back white. Go ahead. This was translated, right? Yeah. I, I believe it's translated. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he said they, they left black and they came back white. Right. He would have known that he would have known some of the history. A lot of the history that we're going over is written in Arabic originally and has to be translated out of Arabic. That's probably part of the reason why it hasn't gotten to us. Um, but and that's just what I could find. I'm pretty sure there's a whole lot more. There's a whole lot that I did find that I didn't put in here. I just kind of took the best of because it's a lot of stuff out there. But um he would have known because he spoke Arabic. He's a president over an uh, Arabic uh, country. And so he would have had access to know that they were black when we, uh, we were black when we left. When we came back, or when they came back, they were white. He knew that they didn't belong, is what he was getting at. So these are pictures of archaeology. Um, these are mostly Assyrian tablets or Assyrian uh, artifacts. And you can see that these are depiction of Hebrews being taken into captivity. All of them, you can see, have typical black features, right? The nappy beards, nappy hair, nappy beard, nappy hair, nappy beard, nappy hair. Looks like dreadlocks, nappy beard, right? These are actual artifacts. You can look them up from Assyria that they were dug up. Um, same thing here, Assyria. 
This is Egypt, right? Same thing, nappy hair. These are all representing Hebrews. Right here, nappy beards, nappy beards, dreads, all that, right? Again here, Assyria, nappy beards, nappy hair, nappy beards, nappy hair. Yeah, and these would have this would these wouldn't be Romans anyway. No, I'm just saying. If but you yeah, in our book they they have the shape that same shape, but it's their helmets. Yeah, and so this is a coin um, from 705 A.D. Um, and this is a picture. This is supposed to be Jesus. All right, it's supposed to be Yahushua. Look at his hair. Right, and this is on the other side of the coin. Look at the difference of the hair. All right, so they knew these things. These things were not. It's not like it always was like Jesus was white. That's a newer invention. All right, they knew in ancient times when they respected them, they respected the black man, and they put them on their coin. Right, and there's multiple versions of this coin even after. I think uh, just. I think it's uh not Julius. Um, yeah, no, he's white. Yeah, he's why he's the actual emperor king at the time. I, I I thought I wrote it down there somewhere, but I didn't. Um, but yeah, he's the actual uh, he's the actual emperor, and then on the other side was the the face of their religion. Okay. Um, these are all Egyptians. These are not Hebrews, right? The reason why that's important, though, let's grab some book real quick. We're gonna go to uh, Genesis chapter fifty. like verse 8 it's Genesis chapter 50 verse 8 I'm going to try to just shoot through these there's a whole lot of stuff we haven't even got to the good stuff yet but we look at all these things to try to show evidence of their skin color alright we look at all these we already looked at some of the artifacts some of the, some of the pictures that we started off with and now we're going to look at we see the Egyptians here these are all ancient Artifacts from Egypt, you see that clearly black, clearly black, clearly black, clearly black, right? A lot of times, a lot of people are, you yeah, know, Egyptians weren't black and all this stuff. But if you look at their artifacts, clearly black, you know, some of their noses are shot off, some of them. So, you know, whatever the conspiracy theory is there. But we have some with the noses still on there. And you can, can clearly see that they're black. So this is Genesis chapter 50, verse 8. In all the house of Joseph and his brethren and his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. All right, so Joseph, we know who that is, right? Joseph was who? Son of who? Jacob. Son of Jacob, right? So he is the son of Jacob. This is after Jacob died. Jacob died. Joseph went all the house, and they're going to do what? Huh? In all the house of Joseph and his brethren and his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds they left in the land of Goshen. Uh-huh. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. And they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan, and there they mourned with a great and very sore lamentation. Right, so they all came to mourn, right? But watch this. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. Mm -hmm. And when the inhabitants of the land of the Canaanites saw the mourning of the floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. To the who? Egyptians. So when they saw Hebrews mourning, the Canaanites who were living in the land, they looked at it and said, man, this is a grievous mourning to who? The Egyptians. To the Egyptians. All right? So they thought we looked like Egyptians. We know the Egyptians were black. And they thought we looked just like them. Right. Grab um, Acts. What is it? Twenty-three. It was late. He was being taken to Felix, right? Let's see. Uh, Acts twenty-one. 21, 21 30, 38. 7, 37. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? 
Art thou not that Egyptian which before these days made an uproar, uproar and led out the wilderness 4,000 men that were murderers? All right. So we see Paul. First, we looked in the Old Testament, Genesis, and it told us that uh, Israelites were mistaken for uh, Egypt's, Egyptians. All right. And now we look in the New Testament, we see the same thing with Paul. He's like, aren't you that Egyptian that made this uproar? Paul's like, no, man, ain't no Egyptian. What you talking about? All right. But you see, we get confused with Egypt, right? Who are clearly black. But look at this. This is a man named Tacitus. Um, he was living 54 to uh, 100, uh, 117 AD. So that's shortly after Yahushua died. That's uh, during the time that our temple was destroyed by the Romans. So we was definitely around in his time, right? He saw us firsthand. He knew exactly who we were, right? But these are his words. So... He's trying to describe or hypothesize of where the, the, he, the Hebrews or the Israelites came from, right? He doesn't know our history, so he's looking at us and he's trying to say, I think maybe they came from here or came from there. So I'm going to jump way down here. It says, others, so he gave some opinions up here. He said, others assert that in the reign of Isis, the overflowing population of Egypt led by Hero, Hero Asylumus, whatever, and Judas discharge itself into the neighboring countries, uh, neighboring countries. So he's saying basically people came from Egypt and they went to the neighboring countries. He said that's where we came from. But then he says again, say that they were a race of Ethiopian origin. Right. So he gave two different opinions that he had like some people say that, you know, Egypt got too many pop people, uh, too much of a population in Egypt, and they just start outflowing to other places. And then other people say that they come from the Ethiopians. They look like Ethiopians, y'all. All right, they look like at any time they'll be mistaken for Ethiopians ever in life. No. All right. So what we see here is based off of everything that we look at through all all of our exiles, we ended up somehow being confused with these people all right so let's talk about our exiles really brief so we were exiled we came out of egypt went into our land into israel then from israel we went into assyria we are exiled into assyria not all of us but our nations um, that were up north so they went into assyria they left israel many of them right according to history actually fled the assyrian persecution and then went into africa Right. If you look at the numbers, I don't have it right now, but if you look at the numbers of what the Bible states went into captivity and you compare those numbers, or well, we suspect the, the total population that it would have been or even the population that came out of Egypt, then you'll see that it's nowhere near. So you would assume that the rest of them either died or the rest of them were taken or, or escaped. Right. So there are there are oral traditions in Africa that says that they went into Africa. Um, around that time and we may get to some of that um, in here um, then you also have the Babylonian uh, exile same thing happened there a few people went into Babylon but then there were also a whole lot of people that didn't and we did have people that stayed we had some people that actually escaped into Egypt okay then we also have the Roman exile where the Romans took over Judah um, and they exiled us put us in slavery and then that gets us to kind of some of the time period that we're going to start going on. So this is a gentleman. He is an African or was an African. Um, his name is Leo Africanus. He was a historian. He has a book where he went through Africa and he described all the lands, all the different people within Africa. Um, and has a very, very extensive uh, three volume book on um, on Africa. And he describes all the different people in three different volumes. And this was written in Arabic. So the translation of it, this is just something I picked out here um, from volume one of his book. It says the Cathates uh, being as black as pitch. Right. So talking about these people, he said the Cathates being as black as pitch and as mighty uh, that are and, and of a mighty stature and some think descendant of the Jews. Right. He tells them so that they're idolaters at this point, so they don't have the religion. But he says some people think that they're descendant of Jews. So notice that he said that they were black as pitch, right? That wasn't odd for his time period. That was known. 
Look at the time periods, though. Pay attention to these time periods, and you're going to see where things switch, right? Just a hint, slavery started, like, around, like, right after this, pretty much. Pretty much right after this, it, it started, uh, the, the slave trade started. Huh? About 16. 1619 is when they brought the first slave, uh, supposedly, into America, but... Yeah, supposedly into America, but they, they the slave trade started well before then. And we'll talk about that for sure. Um, you have a man named Barack Espinoza, or Barack, Barack Spinoza. Um, and this is a description of this gentleman. He was a, a Jew in Spain. So a description of him um, from a man named uh, Il Elz, Elz, whatever. I don't know how to pronounce his name. He's, he's Yules. We'll go with that. He says he was of a middle size. He had good features in his face, the skin somewhat black, black curled hair, long eyebrows, and uh, they are of the same color so that one might easily know by his looks that he was a descendant of the Portuguese Jews. So we see black features. It was well known that he was a descendant from Portugal, right? The Jews in Portugal. So how did Jews get in Portugal? We'll look at Jordanes. All right, this is another historian. He's quite a bit earlier than these other two. Okay, so Jordanes, he says the Sawyer, the Sawyers. This is another different, different type of people. Have swarthy features, and swarthy just means black. Um, he said they have swarthy features and are usually born with curly black hair. They are like the Gauls or the Spaniards. All right, so Spain. If you look, Spain. And uh, Portugal right next to each other, right on the same peninsula, right next to each other. So we see that it was acknowledged at this time, right, at 551, that people were black there, right? So this is Leo Africanus again. We're going back to him. This is also in the volume one of his book. He says, not so much as the name of, of this malady, talking about a, a sexually transmitted disease, right? So he says, not so much as the name of this malady or this sickness, was ever known in Africa before for uh, Ferdinand, the king of Castile, so the king of Spain, right? Ferdinand, the king of uh, Castile, explain, expand, uh, I'm sorry, expelled all Jews out of Spain, right? So he kicked all the Jews out of Spain. He said before that happened, nobody knew about this sexual transmitted disease. He'll go on to explain. After the return of which, return, notice he says that, after the return of which Jews into Africa, Certain unhappy and lewd uh, people lay with their wives. So he said, there's people in Africa that after we returned there, they was unhappy about this. And they started laying with our wives. So they lay with their wives. And so at length that this disease spread from one to another over the whole region into Africa. In so much that it is scarce that any family was free from the same. So he said, this happened so much that everybody in Africa had this disease at one point. Right? And so this is a sexually transmitted disease that they say happened only after the Jews returned into Africa. Remember the time period that he's looking at, right? So he's looking at, if you look at, we're going to talk about when they were expelled from Spain. He's an eyewitness. He lived exactly in that time period. So it's difficult for somebody who's, uh, you know, that, that's a thousand years removed, 500 years removed, looking back to say, no, that didn't happen, right? When you have somebody who's a very respected uh, a person of history, right, who at that time says that Jews returned, right? So he acknowledged that they were already in Africa and then they came back, right? So now let's talk about the exiles, right? So this is an exile from the Iberian Peninsula. The Iberian Peninsula is Spain and uh, Portugal. So the, the exiles from Spain and Portugal. In 1492, Right. Spain expelled Jews as part of the Spanish Inquisition. The Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition or the Inquisitions in Rome. Um, what they were were uh, pretty much the Pope would give approval for people to get cleaned out. Right. They were typically what we're taught right now is that it was directed at Muslims. But that's not entirely true. It was directed at black people. All right. It would it just so happened that black people were Muslims and black people were Jews. Right. So we got caught in new as well. When they got rid of us, they said, this is the Spanish Inquisition. Let's get them out of here. So they would take us. They would kill us. They would enslave us. 
um, Jews sought asylum. So after that happened in Spain, remember Spain, Portugal, right next to each other. Then we saw the asylum in Portugal. So at first, Portuguese, the, the Portuguese people, they was welcoming us. Remember, we're all the same people anyway. We we're all over there, too. So they were welcoming us. However, the Portuguese government decreed to the enslavement of all Jews who had not left the country. or um, And they, then they deported several hundred of their children to Sao Tome. Sao Tome just means St. Thomas. Yeah, that's an island. So this is a Portuguese island that was created. They deported our children, right? They took our children and put them there. We're going to talk a little bit more about this island, and I'll show you guys where it is. But they, um, they, they put our children there, and then they started enslaving us. So this is where it began, Portugal. Very important to remember that. Portugal, they started to enslave us first, and they just enslaved us at, at home because we were there. We all left Spain. When we left Spain, we either went into Africa or we went, um, we went into uh, Portugal. And why do you think we went into Africa? Because we, we blend in there, right? If we go up north, we stick out like a sore thumb. These inquisitions are going on all over, right? You go to the south and you go into Africa. And Africa is literally, you could just hop one little boat, short boat, boat ride, and you get right into Morocco, right? So you go right in there and that was our people, right? Well, let's see. Seo Tome is right here. So this is West Africa. I'll tell you guys, I'll just do a spoiler. This is where the slaves were picked up from, right along this coast. This is what they call the slave coast. This is where Seo Tome is. A very small island right off of the coast of West Africa where all the slaves are picked up. This island is where our children first, once they discovered this island, they put our kids there as slaves. And they took children, right? We're going to go into it a little more. So this kind of zooms in on it. All right, just kind of go into it. So now we're going to talk more about here. So continuing on with that history, following King John. So King John was uh, a king in Portugal who enslaved the Jews. Um, uh, so following his death in uh, 1494, the new king, Manuel I of Portugal, resorted the freedom of the Jews. So the Jews, that the, 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 the king that enslaved us and sent our, ch our children to Sao Tome, he died. Then the next king came along and he gave us freedom, right? So he saw freedom for us. However, three years later, under the pressure of a newly born Spanish state, um, because he was getting married and it, part of their marriage contract, he had to get rid of the Jews. And it was agreed upon between the, the uh, Roman Catholic Church, um, the Queen of Spain, Spain um, and they all kind of agreed on it. So as part of that uh, agreement, King Manuel I had decreed that all Jews had to convert to Christianity or leave the country without their children. So remember what happened to our children. So that's why they had to leave without their children because our children are going to end up going to Sao Tome. So they had to leave without their children. Um, and he said, after that, hard time. So we either converted or we had to leave. Most of us left. Um, and then we had, they have a whole history. I, don't, I didn't document too much of it here, but they have a whole history about uh, people who, well, well, actually, we will talk about it. I do have something on here. Um, so we had to either convert or leave. We leave. Then it says, uh, hard times followed for the Portuguese Jews, uh, with the massacre of 2000 individuals in Lisbon in 1506, further forced deportations to Sao Tome. All right. So we are forcefully deported to Sao Tome later on after that. Um, and, and later even more relevant establishment of Portuguese inquisition. So now the Portuguese have their own inquisition on top of them putting us in slavery. All right. So inquisition is hunting people down. Right. You're kind of looking for them. Like you want to find them. Where are they? Make sure they're not there. Make sure we dealt with them. So these are kind of like just timelines. The Spanish Inquisition started 1478, 1834. The Portuguese Inquisition started 1536, 1827. I mean, 21. The slave trade began in the 15th century. So that would be the last half of the 15th century. So that would be like 1450, somewhere between 1450 and 1500, right? Um, then, then you have 1807. Britain and America claimed to have ended the Atlantic slave trade, right? So that's 1807. They stopped it. 1810, Britain all this time had been trying to stop all the European countries to, to stop the slave trade. The Portuguese, however, they were like, well... You're not going to get us to stop completely, but we will agree 
not to do any slave trades above the equator. So they limited their slave trade, and that happened in 1810. Portugal finally stopped completely the slave trade in 1870. Look at these dates. The Inquisitions lasted the whole time of slavery. All right? Is that a coincidence? I think not. So this is another, or another person in history. His name is Eldad the Danite. I love this guy, right? So Eldad the Danite, just a little bit about him. Eldad introduced himself as a Jew from the tribe of Dan. So notice he's not just saying I'm a Jew. He's telling you what tribe he's from, right? That's our, that's our culture. That's what we do. We want to identify our tribe. We want to identify our fathers. So he says he's from the tribe of Dan, which lived independently and had its own government and declared that the ten, he declared that the ten tribes survived in various parts of Africa and the Near East. All right, so this was his testimony, and he, he rolled around. We never hear about these things. He lived in the, the time of 18, I mean, I'm sorry, 880, so 880 A.D. Um, then we have another man named David Rubini, right? So he's just saying he, he's a Reubenite um, from the tribe of Reuben, right? His name was David. He's a very interesting person, too. You know what I'm saying? He, he was more like a man of war. He wanted to establish the, the nation again. So he found out that our people were in, were in captivity, and he's another one that's like, no, nah, not all of our people. Or our people, some people from our people in Africa. So he's another one that told us that. Here's uh, some of the things that's written about him. So the judge also asked me, this is uh, uh, David who's writing this. The judge also asked me, what will you do with all the Jews and all the lands of the West? Talking about in all of Europe. All the lands of the West. Will you come to the West for them? And how will you deal with them? All right. So he, well, they want to know, what are you going to do? And then he says, I replied, I replied that we shall first take the Holy Land and its surroundings um, uh, that that. And its surroundings and that then our captains of the host will go forth uh, to the west and gather all of the dispersed of Israel. So what he's trying to do is recapture Israel, reestablish our land. Right now it was it was uh, ruled by uh, Gentiles. And so he says, and whoever is wise amongst the Muslim kings will, uh, where am I? Whoever is wise amongst the Muslim kings uh, will take the Jews under his rule and bring them into Jerusalem. So he's saying, if you're a Muslim king and we dwell in amongst you, if you're smart, You'll bring us uh, back to Jerusalem once we take the land, because his plan is to go up, conquer Israel again, take it from the Muslims, take it from the Christians. All right. Um, and God will deliver much honor greater than that to all of the Muslim kings. And God will duh, 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 God will deliver up all the kings to the kings of Jerusalem. All right. So he's saying, does it be good for you? Bring all my people back. All right. So this is what happens next. Um, in the ninth century, the ninth century Jews were no less enchanted by Eldad as tales of the lost tribes. Um, so they, you know what I'm saying? They kind of looked at Eldad and, uh, Reuben, the same, I mean, uh, David, the same because he, they talked about the lost tribes and everything, but you see his time period is much later, right? He's during this time of the inquisitions and everything. So watch what happens to him. So, uh, they asked him. Was he the Messiah? He answered, he says, uh, I answered, God forbid, I am a sinner before the Lord, greater than any, uh, any one of you. I have slain many men, and on a day I killed 40 enemies. I am neither a prophet nor a son of a prophet, neither a wise man or a Kabbalist, but I am a captain of hosts and the son of Solomon the king, the uh, son of David and the son of Jesse, and my brother the king rules over 30 uh, myriads in the wilderness of Hebor. Moreover, the Moranos, so the Moranos are converts, right? So the Moranos in the kingdom of Portugal and all the Jews uh, in Italy and all the places that I passed also thought me to be a prophet, wise man or Kabbalist. And I said to them, God forbid, I am a sinner. I am a man of war from my youth till now, right? So he says, I'm not, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not going, you know, I'm not, I'm not that guy. I'm just a man of war. Watch what he say next. Afterwards, the judge began to write a letter to the Jews in Fez. So I'll let you guys know Fez is in Africa. It's North Africa. So we saw that there were Jews in Fez. 
This is where he came all the way to Spain just to do this. He wants to contact the Jews in Fez. So he wrote to the Jews in Fez. All right. This is um, from the College of Fordham. Uh, they wrote some history about the expulsion from, uh, from uh, Spain. So real quick, they say, many exiled Spaniards went to the Mohammedan country. So in other words, the Muslim countries. To Fez and all these other places that I'm not about to try to pronounce, um, Berber provinces under the king of Tunis, these North uh, African lands across the Mediterranean, Mediterranean from Spain, on account of the large numbers, the Moors, notice they say Moors, the Moors did not allow them into their cities, and many of them died in the fields for hunger, thirst, and lack of everything. The lions and the bears, uh, which are number, numerous in those countries, Killed them, and uh, while they were while they were starving outside the cities, all right. So this is what happened. Our people, we tried to go into these Muslim countries, and notice it says the Moors didn't like us. The Moors were black people that were Muslims, right? They had been converted. Now, there are some people that make you convinced of otherwise. So this is another video. This is a video, um, a clip from uh, the DVD called Hidden Colors. It's a very popular DVD amongst the woke crowd, the conscious black community, so-called. This is what they have to say in this DVD. The term more started to, to become interchangeable with the term black because it was basically the same thing. But when the slave trade started, they tried to objectify um, black people, Moorish people. So they would use the term interchangeably and they would just switch on to calling people black. But if you look at a lot of old documents, there's even sh slave ships called Blackamoor, if you look at slave records. There was even a boxer out of Virginia who was very popular in the early 1800s named Tom Molyneux, and his nickname was The Moor. So that name was definitely used interchangeably with black or Negro at that time. Sounds like it makes a whole lot of sense, right? Well, let's take a look at some old documents for ourselves. This is Leo Africanus, okay? Leo Africanus again. So he said, the Jews indeed first dwelt in old Fez, just like we just read, right? So we see this from multiple accounts. They're all saying the same thing. The Jews indeed, indeed first dwelt in old Fez, all right? Then we jump on down, all robbed by the Moors, all right? So they were all robbed by the Moors. That's very interesting. Next it says, ever since they were driven... Out of Spain, these Jews are had in great contempt by all men. So the Jews weren't liked by anybody when they went into these Muslim countries, right? So he's telling us in this DVD that Moors, Negroes, Black, all pretty much the same thing, right? This is a man named Mungo Park, Gentile, right? He went into Africa. He went into Africa 12, uh, he was living actually, 1263 to 1328. So this is before any of the expulsions from Spain, Portugal, this is before the slave trade. This is what he said when he went into the Africa before anybody was expelled from Spain. I'm going to skip some of it. The major part of the inhabitants are Negroes from the borders of the southern states who prefer a precarious protection under the Moors. Does it sound like they're used interchangeably? No. Moors, Negroes, two very distinct things. He said... Negroes, and they like protection of the Moors. We go on further. The Moors of this and the other states adjourning to this country of the Negroes, so the Negro country, resemble in their persons like the mulattoes. So he said these Moors in this area, they is light-skinned, right? He said the mulattoes of the West Indies, all right? So this is what this gentleman said, Gentile, Mungo Park, before any of it went down. He said there was a clear, clear distinction. So now I think the Hidden Colors DVD would contest as slavery got started, that's when they start kind of mixing stuff up. Well, let's see. We have U.S. documents, right? I have little pictures of some of them up here. Three U.S. documents that prove that to be a lie. You have the Moore Sundry Act, right? The Moore Sundry Act, which some of them, the same people that say that we are Moors, they'll point to this same Sundry Act. But, you know, interestingly, inside of this same act, it says specifically that Moors should not be treated like Negroes. Right inside of it. And this is from 17, uh, 1790. 
right? So there was already a distinction in America, difference between a Moor and a uh, Negro. The reason why they had to come up with this law is because of this agreement. This is a Moroccan-American Treaty of Friendship, right? This Treaty of Friendship was an agreement between the King of Morocco, which is Fez, right? All that's Morocco. The King of Morocco um, and America. They made an agreement with each other that part of this agreement, it's a whole lot of stuff, but part of the agreement says that if a Moor does anything wrong, then they have to be treated like a citizen of the U.S. So when it came down to a court case with Moors, they was like, whoa, 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 hold on. They brought that to, um, I think it was in Virginia. They brought that and they said, you know what, y'all going to have to treat us different according to the treaty that y'all made with our people. So they had to come up with this law to protect Moors from Negroes. And then the last document is a letter. Um, this is actually the first document, though. But uh, this is a letter from George Washington to the king, the sultan of Morocco. And he's just basically praising them and, and making friends with them. And that's what led to this treaty. Right. So all these those things prove that there was a clear distinction. What it came from, the reason why people say that now that we were all Moors and all that stuff. The reason why they say that now is because when you were a slave and you were black and then you had another black person who was a Moor who was not a slave and they got all the rights as all these white people and you black from a white person's eye, you look just like him. What you want to you want to call yourself a Negro or you going to call yourself a Moor? You a slave. You getting whipped on your back right now. And you see him walking free. He looks just like you. No, nah, you got y'all got the wrong guy. I'm with him. That's my cousin. Right? So we start trying to call ourselves Moors to get freedom. And we had to try to prove it out. Right? But we weren't actually Moors. We were Negroes. Right? We were Hebrews. And we're gonna go and further prove that. So this is uh son to Maya, right? The root of the beginning of slavery, right? So this is him. He's a Muslim. The root of the beginning of slavery is prisoners of war. The bounties have become lawful for the nation of the Muhammad, right? So in other words, the Muslims. He said the Muslims are the ones who started the slavery, right? And the way that they did it is because they took prisoners of war. And it was lawful for them to take these prisoners of war and make them slaves, right? Slavery is justified because the war itself, right? So because I had war with you, slavery now becomes justified, right? However, it is not permissible to enslave a free Muslim. So if you come across a Muslim, you cannot enslave him, right? It is lawful to kill the infidel or to enslave him, and then it also makes it lawful to take his offspring into captivity as well. So this was the Muslims thinking. I'm going to show you guys that the Muslims came from Saudi Arabia and they took over all of Africa, right? Definitely the northern parts of Africa. And they forced people to either convert into Islam or they killed them or enslaved them, right? And that's how all this stuff happened. This is another, uh, this is an, expert from, um, an excerpt from a man uh, named Willem Balsman, right? I'm just going to jump right down to, a, to the bottom here. So he's a Gentile. Watch what he says. He says, not a few in our country finally imagine that the parents here sell their children, men, their wives, and one brother, the other, right? So he's like, people, us, us Europeans, we imagine, I know a lot of y'all imagine that you just got Africans just selling each other, selling their own family members out. Watch what he say. Uh, but those who think so do deceive themselves. This never happens on any other account but of necessity or some grave crime. But most of the slaves that are offered unto us are prisoners of war, which are sold by the victors of their booty. Right? So we look at these things. Who was having war? Right? It was Muslims conquering people, enslaving them. That was their protocol. We just read it. Right? That was their protocol, and they justified it. So these Moors, the reason why we go into that, because Moors, Negroes, black people, not the same, right? Not the same at all. Moors are a very particular people, and it was justified for them to enslave people, right? The slave trade really began with the Muslims. They first took us slaves, and then they sold us to Europeans afterwards, and we'll get into more of that. So this is Mungo Park again. Um, he says, and even the Moors themselves allowed that though I was a Christian, I was a better man than a Jew, right? So the Christians who went up, you, we, we've heard all of these 
inquisition, excuse me, all of these inquisitions that went up against um, Muslims and the Christians and the Muslims fall from ancient times and, the, and they were slaughtering each other and all that. That's all we heard about. We didn't hear that. Well, compared to a Jew, a Christian is all right. So we were in Africa amongst Muslims when we, just like we read from other words, we were held in contempt by all men, right? So Jews were the lowest of the low in Africa, right? The lowest of the low. And Mungo Park acknowledged that. All right? So now, this is um, Oludo, Alauda, Alauda Equino, right? He is an actual slave. He was brought over to the States. Um, he then wrote a book. Well, he, he was brought over to the States, sold a few times. Then he uh, was sold to a European, took him into Europe, and that man allowed him to write a book. The reason why is because that's the time period that they started to try to stop slavery. Stop, stop, stop the slave trade, not slavery, but they wanted to try to stop the slave trade in Europe. In America, not so much. So when he got out of America, he was sold to a European. He went there. And things were kind of lighter. So they let him write a book. They used the book that he write, wrote to try to convince people to stop the slave trade. Okay? So that's the purpose of his book. But in his book, he describes what he went through. So we're just going to read from ex some experts from his book. This is from his own mouth. This is an African slave, one of the men who actually got picked up, and he remembered where he came from. He wasn't someone who, who got picked up and he died and his son, you know, had no connection to his roots. He got picked up, he remembered his time there, and he wrote a book about it. Nobody told us about this book. But watch what the man says, it says, interesting enough. We practiced circumcision like the Jews and made offerings and feasts onto the same occasions in the same manner as they did. Like them also, our ch children were named from some event, some circumstance or uh, fancied forebo foreboding at the time of their birth. I have before remarked that the natives of this part of Africa are extremely cleanly. Um, this, this, this necessary habit of decency was with us a part of religion, and therefore we had many purifications uh, and washings. Indeed, almost as many as... I always lose my spot. Almost as many and used on the same occasion... If my recollection does not fail me as the Jews, those that uh, touch the dead at any time were obliged to wash and purify themselves before they could enter a dwelling house. Um, every woman, too, at certain times was forbidden to come into the dwelling house or touch any person or anything that we ate. I was so fond of my mother, I could not keep from her or avoid touching her at some uh, um, at some of those periods in consequence of which I was obliged to be kept out with her in little house made for her uh, for that purpose till offering was made, then we were purified. So that's exactly what we read in our law, right? He described it. He's just saying based off of memory, yeah, it's just like the Jews. We did the same stuff. We circumcised and we had all this stuff. Is that a coincidence? Let's see. What's going on here? Did I go too far? Okay. Um, then here goes another one, same person. He says, all the nations and people I had hitherto passed through resembled our own in their manners, custom, and languages. So he said, so let me kind of fill the gap. So that was him describing the, like the first chapter, like, you know, how he was raised. Then after that, he got, he got taken as a slave in Africa, though. So one African grabbed him up, made him a slave, and then sold him. So he was bought. He kept on being bought by people just like him. Why do you think that may? He didn't describe it because I don't think he knows, but why do you think that may have happened? If somebody's selling a slave, we are the same people. According to our law, what would we do? We would redeem our brother, right? We had a law that we could redeem our brothers, right? Yeah. Right. So this is what we're looking at. He kept on being bought by his own people. Right. He's, and he's telling he is like 
Every everywhere I went, they all resembled us. They spoke a similar language. They had they had the same customs. They was all cleanly, all the same stuff, right? So he said, this stuff. I mean, everywhere I'm going, it's the same thing. He said, um, but I came at length to a country of inhabitants which differed from us, uh, or which differed from us. A people who did not circumcise ate without washing their hands. Their women were not so modest as ours. I'm skipping some stuff. Above all, I was amazed to see no sacrifices or offerings. Um, the people ornamented themselves with scars. Likewise, uh, they, they fouled their teeth very sharp, right? So this is how they painted us as slaves, right? They painted us. They made us believe that we were this people that he described. He people that they were not modest. They didn't clean, right? Didn't make offerings. All they did, they fouled their teeth and put scars on themselves and did weird stuff, right? That's the Africans that they show us today. Right. You see, it's not that they are lying. Those according to him, those Africans did exist, but they didn't tell us about the other Africans. Right. The ones that was actually taken as slaves. Notice these weren't taken as slaves. Watch what he says. Why is it not working? Watch what he says. He said that part of Africa known by the name of Gunea, right, to which the trade for slaves is carried on, extends along the coast. 3,400 miles into the Senegal and uh, Angola, right? And, to, and it has a variety of kingdoms. Why is it not working? There we go. Agriculture, he said, agriculture is our chief employment, and everyone, even the children and women, are engaged in it. Thus, we are all inhabitants of labor from our earliest years. Everyone contributes something to the common stock as we are unacquainted with idleness. Right, so he said, we ain't lazy, we gets down, right? He says, we have no beggars. Uh, the benefits of such a mode uh, of living is are obvious. Um, the, West Indian plant, uh, the West Indian planters preferred slaves from Benin and Igbo. So remember that, Igbo. Benin and Igbo, um, to those of any other part of Guinea, their, for their hardiness and their intelligence and integrity and zeal. So he's telling us there, there are other Africans but they, they, they prefer the ones from these places. I wonder why. They're the Hebrews, right? They had customs, right? The other, I mean, they didn't want the ones that the foul they teeth down and all that stuff, right? They said they wanted these. So a little bit about a story that I didn't put in here. Um, he was taking captives from Hebrew to Hebrew. He kept on being redeemed by his own people. He doesn't describe it that way, but I know that because I know the law, what was going on. But he just describes it as he was bought, and he kept on marveling like, these people are just like me, and they treat me like family. They don't treat like he had slaves in his. He said he actually has a uh, excerpt from the book. I almost put it in here. He is like the slaves that we had in no way are treated like the slaves that we had. He said when we have slaves, we we feed them. They're they're just like family, but they just can't eat with us. So they eat at a different place. But you know everybody everybody's working. It's not like we sit there and they work. We all take a portion of the work. Everybody works. Everybody's doing the same thing. So. He, when he moved on, he was like, yeah, I was taking slave, but he was like, they treat me even better than we treat slaves at home. I get to sit at the table. Like, they treat me like family, right? So he marveled at that. He thought that was special each place that he went. One place he tried to escape because he thought he was going to get in trouble. I think he killed, like, a chicken on an accident or something. And then, um, and then one of the ladies was like, I'm going to tell, you know, I'm going to tell on you, this, that, and other. And he was like, oh, no. So he ran away, hid in the bush, and he was hiding out. And then they finally found him because he is starving. He didn't have no food. So they finally found him because they were looking for him. When they found him, the master, who was another, he is a Hebrew just like him, he just brought him in and he is like, gave him something to eat, told him to lay down, told him everything was good. All right? And so that he was marveled because he is scared because he'd been taken away. He was young when this happened. It was like 11. Right? Him and his sister got taken. Okay? So this is CNN. This is recent. This is from 2013. Right? CNN. So you remember we said he he said that they liked the uh, the slaves from Benin and Igbo. This is what he's saying. Igbo, Nigeria's Igbo Jews, lost tribe of Israel. Question mark. Remember, 2013. CNN's writing about this. They they're not gonna connect us to it though. They don't say nothing about this is where the slaves got picked up from, even though this is this is basic knowledge and they know it but they do they do go you know go into some of it right so if we jump right here from generation to generation some Igbo 
have passed down various versions of migration stories framed around Jacob, a patriarch in Judaism. A popular version of the narrative holds that Gad, the seventh son of Jacob, and the three sons who settled in present-day southeastern Nigeria, which is predominantly inhabited by Igbo. All right? So this is an oral tradition already in the land of Africa. Right? We don't hear about none of this stuff. It says, when I grew up, this is a man, this is a, a man from, uh, from the Igbos. He says, when I grew up, I heard like virtually every other Igbo here that the Igbo people came from Israel. Um, then he goes on to say, where does it continue? Um, uh, his field of work in Nigeria, Chad, Niger, and Mali, and we'll go, we'll go back to the map and we'll look at all those places led him to conclude that the Igbo and the Jewish culture are not just similar, but identical, right? These are people that don't have a Bible, don't have any of those things. They don't even know who they are, right? They just practice, practice it by oral tradition, right? In this latest book, uh, whatever, it draws parallels. We'll skip that. Um, down here, it says, um, this gentleman from Jewish Studies, University of Basel, Switzerland, so this is a man in Switzerland, is one of the foremost researchers on Jewish identification among the Igbo. He says that there has been a clear continuity of Jewish identity amongst the Igbo, and it, quote, it's not just something that happened yesterday, he says. So this is not just something that they came up with. They say, hey, I want to be something that the Americans will respect. He said, this is not something that happened yesterday. This is ancient, right? We never hear about this stuff. So this is this is Africa. This is North Africa here. This right here is the Iberian Peninsula. This is a little corner of Portugal, Spain. This is where they would have came down to. Fez is about in this area, right? So they would have came here, got kicked out. So they were held in contempt by all men. So they were driven down. And you see that the gentleman in the CNN article he mentioned Chad, Niger, Mali, Nigeria, Ghana, right? So all this area. So this is where they were driven down into. If we go to this map, it's called Negro land, right? Right here. And then below that, below that is called Guinea, right? And that's the same area that he said they like the slaves from Guinea, right? And then you have the kingdom of Benin right here, right? The Igbo people were all in here. What does Igbo sound like? Hebrew, right? But they're saying it, right? They're saying it in a different way. So it's it's Hebrew. The 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 Igbo is what it is, but it's it's Hebrew, right? And it's just kind of a messed up way of kind of saying it. They have a few different ways. Another way that they say it is Ivwe, right? The Ivwe. So the actual word Hebrew, the way we say it, is Hebrew. That's how it's transliterated into English. If you look up the Hebrew word for it, it's actually Ivrit, right? But they say that it's pronounced wrong, that it actually should be pronounced if what, if what, if what, something like that. I can't pronounce it either, but they say it's if what, right? So that's why um, you remember uh, 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 Alan's, wi uh, yeah, Alan's wife, or Alan's girl, are they married? Alan's wife, um, his, yeah, Monique, she, her, her dad is from Ghana. And that's why when I was talking to him, I was trying to get some information out of him. Because they know it, they know it. It's plain knowledge for them. It's just passed down. A lot of them don't acknowledge it. It doesn't really mean much to them. But it's plain knowledge from them. If you meet anybody from Ghana, meet anybody from Nigeria, South Nigeria, um, then just ask them plainly. Just say, "Yeah, are you from the Igbo people? You ever heard about you guys being descendants from the Israelites or anything like that?" And then most of them will tell you because they've heard it. It's it's common around there from everybody I've talked to and everything I've seen. It's common around. It's just not something that we hear about, right? So if we look here, this is the slave trade, right? So we just talked about those areas. This is where the slave trade came from, right here, right here, and down here, right? They call this the what? Slave coast. This area right here. And that's where the bulk of us were. And that's where the bulk of us came from, right? And then they brought us all these different places, um, and some of them, you know, even went back up north there. So we go back to this. This is what they are calling the slave coast. This is where Sao Tome is. All of it is right here. This is 
Passover. All of it is happening there right here. So they go in. Muslims are forcing Hebrews from up here. These are all Muslim ran places. This stuff was uninhabited for the most part before us. So we go here, a lot of we a lot of woods in this area. So all here is more desert, it's more, you know, land, dry land where you can build on. All this, bunch of trees, bunch of bunch of forests, all types of stuff down there. So it's a lot of stuff places where you can hide and all that. We go down in here and hide. And there's a whole lot of stuff I didn't put in here. There's a whole lot of accounts of just that where people who Mungo Park, um, uh, Leo Africanus, uh, there's another gentleman who traveled through Africa. There's a few people who traveled through Africa and described everything they saw. Almost all of them describe, once they get into these areas, they describe Jew nations, right? People of Jew nations getting together, hiding out, and are secluded to themselves. Or if they didn't see it for themselves, they'll say, I've heard of the Israelites or descendant of the Israelites being in that area. And they say it just like that, right? So this stuff was not hidden knowledge all the time. It suddenly became hidden right after the slave trade started. Huh? Yeah, they probably would. I didn't. I didn't read that, but yeah, they probably they probably did, um, because uh, the, everything I read they were hiding out, right? So this is the the map from today. We're gonna go back to the other map, right? This here. I want y'all to focus in on this area right here, right? This area right here. It's something very interesting about this area. We're gonna zoom in. This says Kingdom of Judah in Africa, right here. So this would be modern day Benin, right? So if we go back, go back one, go back two, this would be right here. All right, Benin, Togo, Nigeria, a little bit of Ghana, it's like this area right here. They have the Kingdom of Judah right here. Is that a coincidence? Who named these people on the map? Portugal. All right, Portugal did. So Portugal is the one to name. Portu the Portuguese knew exactly who we were. Is basically what it comes down to. The Portuguese, one, they started the slave trade. I didn't know that until I looked this up. They were the ones that began the slave trade. They were the ones who first enslaved Jews. They were the ones who first sent Jews to West Africa. All right. They were the ones who had a, a... I thought the Asian coast was the first to enslave. Asian coast? Mm-hmm. No, so this no, right here. Slave coast. They came off of... Um, okay, I mean, I know about that coast, too, but I thought they were, uh, when they came in, uh, over by... Asians? Mad yeah, over by Madagascar. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. I don't know about that. Asia Minor, all the, it, the way it comes over... They were the first to bring blacks over, and but they were the um, I forgot what kind of slaves they were. They weren't like uh, in the slave trade. They were slaves, but it was because they had the Indigent boats to service. bring them over. Yeah, service. In Indigent Indigent service. service. Yeah, they uh, had to work. You know. Oh yeah, that might yeah that was that was a separate slavery though. Yeah, yeah but you know it was, it's a whole lot of it's a whole lot of slavery that happened, but. But yeah, that would that would have been a separate instance. But for this instance, yeah, Portugal started it off. It would that I don't think Asia was a part of the slave the transatlantic slave trade at all. But um, but yeah, they 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 uh, picked us up primarily from this area and all this area, and we're documented as being in all of these places. Um, so then it says literally Kingdom of Judah right there. It says Slave Coast right here and. Uh, and puts it all right. So this is all. All of this goes right along with what the gentleman was saying um, in this book, right? We did exactly what the Jews are doing, right? We're identical, right? Same thing that the testimony in the CNN article. Same thing if we look at the pictures, it all lines up. The old pictures before all this stuff popped off, before it was bad to be a Jew, before it was bad to be black and a Jew, right? It all. They all had pictures of us, and you know it was normal. Right? It was a normal thing. It was accepted even amongst the Roman Empire. Right? So we look at these things and just to kind of quickly review, we have historical maps, right, that we just looked at that shows it. We have prophecy, right, that gives us the idea of who we are, which we didn't even really go over prophecy much, but we'll do that another time for sure. Um, then we have ancient art, 
we have archaeology, and we have tons. We have absolutely tons of historical testimony um, that talk about Jews not only being in Africa, but specifically the skin color of Jews, right? We know exactly where the skin color, I mean, the, these Jews that they spoke about were, and we also know where they were picked up from. We know that the Portugal people, the people of Portugal, they first enslaved us, they first sent us to West Africa, and then those same people were the leaders of the slave trade, and what do you know? Where did all these slaves get picked up from? The same place where they sent the African slaves, I mean, I'm sorry, the Jew, Jewish slaves or the Jew slaves that they picked up, all right? They started the slave trade by first making us Jews, I mean, I'm sorry, making us slaves and then sending us to West Africa. Then all of a sudden, this huge slave trade that they profited on, that they, they were the first to start and the last to end, and their inquisition lasted the entire time pretty much, right? They're the ones who led it and that led us. We say that not to look at them and be like, I can't believe the Portuguese or anything like that. We say that to say it's not a coincidence who they picked up. They knew who they were picking up. They were the same people they were trying to get out of their country, same people they had already enslaved. And then they were like, well, since we're doing, we're trading slaves now, I got an idea of some people we can pick up, and I'll tell you where they are, right? Yeah, and most of them, and they hair, the only way you could really tell the difference was their hair texture, because they were dark-skinned, too. Who? Are we still recording? Huh? We're still recording? Yeah, we're still recording. No, not all of the Portuguese. We were, we were, so the Portuguese, the reason why you see that is because the Portuguese and Spain, they were taken over by the Moors from like 700 AD. And then they just, around this time that they were doing all these Spanish inquisitions and all that, that's when they gained, they reconquered it from the Moors. But not all of them were white. You had a lot of mixed people in there because Moors ran it the whole time. They were kings and they were running everything for that, that whole period of time. So it was a mixed culture at first, um, but they they weren't they weren't the port. What happened after that, after the Inquisition, it was more of a cleansing. It was bringing their people back to being who they thought they should have historically been instead of being constantly mixed with Africans because it was right there on Africa. It was North Africa, their borders. So since they are all mixed together, it always been like a mixed area and it was always dark people there. But then they started to push people out. And that's when you start seeing the switch of. Hebrews being black to now you just have Jewish people who are converts, but then they later on start to take on the identity. Um, even some of them, we didn't, I didn't, I didn't put that in here, but even some of the the converts um, participating in the slave trade by purchasing ships and uh, things of that nature um, and making a lot of money off of it. Right? I have another, I have another document that I didn't put in there, but it's a, a document that shows the profits uh, that that they would make from slave trading in like 1870 or 1820 something, 1830 something, maybe maybe like 1838, they were making uh, profit from just, just the person who, who drove the boat, right? Spin, I mean, he dished out some big money, but he said at the end of the day, net profit, $40,000 in that time, right? So that's like millions of dollars. Yeah, the, they, millions the of dollars. money that was, it just didn't sound like they would have the, that type of money then, they were making money. Oh, they, they, a lot of people were making money off slavery. A lot of people. Not just people. So slaves cost a lot, right? When you wanted to buy a slave, it wasn't, it's not like every white person had slaves, right? They were, they were very expensive, right? You couldn't just like go and just go buy a slave. Like, no, nah, I just need a slave. You had money. Yeah, you got to have money to get a slave. A lot of them had slaves, but they were one of the really big properties. Yeah, you, you'd, have to have, you'd have to have some real money to get slaves. But, what would happen is there were other ways to, 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 to get in on slavery and make money off of it. So you have the slave traders. You, could, you can ride on the boats um, and go, you know, go across the way and collect the slaves. Um, you could, uh, could kind of insure slaves, right? So they had insurance on slaves. A lot of people don't know that. Wells Fargo um, and um, there's a... Yeah, well, there's a few other, but I think J.P. Morgan, too. Um, but for sure, Wells Fargo, um, they, they, they used to insure slaves. So they would put you know, insurance on slaves. If you lose your slave, they'd pay you out. So they are making money off of it. Everybody, just, they had, they had like, like how we have stock options now, they had something similar to that for slaves too. You know what I'm saying? Just kind of like betting against it or betting for them. So it was a whole lot of money being made on slaves, not just from the rich people who own the slaves, 
but people related to. And then also, if you you probably had somebody in your family who owned a slave, and so you would you know inherit one. They would they would gift slaves. So just the same way that things happen today, people you know you had these white families that we don't really you know know about all the stuff that goes on, but you had these white families and they you know they'll you know buy you know a house for their children or something like that, all right? Or they'll you know they'll start you know give them the money to start their business or something like that. In the same way, they would say, oh yeah, that's my niece. Yeah, thanks. You know, here, there you go. Take a slave. All right. It happened in Birth of a Nation. You can see that type of stuff happening and everything. So it was a common practice to kind of give slaves. So you'll see that the benefit from slavery was wide amongst everybody. Um, and even for the people that didn't, and even for the people that didn't benefit from it, they at least got to go at a normal pace of collecting wealth and, and establishing something in society. Whereas we, we had to go backwards at the time that they were going forward. We were hell stagnant, couldn't do anything, couldn't collect anything, didn't have any rights. And then later on, they're like, oh, we all have rights, we're all equal. But no, that's not true, right? You've had all this time to amass a whole lot of wealth. Some of you amass a whole lot of wealth on our backs that we really deserve and we haven't been given anything. And the whole time, we have Obama and, and Trump and, and Bill Clinton and every other president that expresses their that expresses their 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 undying um, and unfettering uh, support of Israel. Meanwhile, Israel is being shot and killed and um, has illegal laws, you know, placed against them, unjust laws, um, right in their midst. All right, so this is our history, right? This is, these are things that we talk about. What I'm also going to start doing um, for the rest of the month, I'm going to try to put together some quick, maybe two minute videos. Um, of some of the people that I learned about during during doing these investigations and trying to figure out this stuff. Um, so I learned about a Hebrew queen that was in North Africa. Um, I learned about Eldad, David, so I'm probably going to do videos on them. And then there was a few other gentlemen that were in uh, East Africa that, you know, that were highly respected in Muslim kingdoms and things like that. So I'm going to try to do videos on all. I have the queen, her video done, so she's going to be the first one that we release. But um, we'll look at that and kind of go over it. That way we can see and we can start propagating some of our stuff, some of the truth that we have to, to the masses of the people um, so that we'll have something to tie back to. But then also that so many people won't be blind when the, prophecy, when the prophecies begin to, to fulfill themselves. They won't miss them because they're looking at a, a different particular people. Like all these Christians who we just saw in the video, why do the Jew, why do they care about the Jews so much? Well, they're looking at the wrong people, so they're looking for prophecies. That's why every time somebody sneezes over in Israel, they think it's the end of the world, right? They go, oh, here it goes, the apocalypse and all this stuff. It's because they're looking at those people thinking it's that that's how it's going to happen out, but it's not, right? The people, the as it relates to prophecy, the people that have to we have to look at is us, right? And you'll see how when we start moving, where when things start switching around with us, that's going to be the real precursor. All right, any questions?